And what we're going to do now is to go on to our next section, which is looking, as I say, at building and construction. Some really interesting innovation uh, going on there. Uh, and we've got um, four people to offer us their initial thoughts uh, on this. Um, and uh, we'll have a lucky dip of ideas and thoughts coming through. And then we'll develop the conversation as we did before. So delighted, first of all, just checking that he's here, uh, Christoph Reinhardt, fantastic. Associate Pre Professor, MIT Architecture. So doing a lot of work around the whole buildings construction side, a lot of really interesting stuff happening. Um, from all the stuff you could have talked about, what are you going to talk to us about today? I'm going to talk about energy and daylight. OK, energy and daylight. I'm not sure are we. Oh, here we go. Uh, good morning. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Peter, for the introduction. Thanks to Carlo and Aaron for inviting me. This is very exciting. Um, I'm going to talk about urban energy systems and just uh, 20 seconds about our group. I lead at MIT a lab that's called uh, the Sustainable Design Lab, and we are developing workflows and uh, tools and metrics similar to the metrics that you talked about before, trying to analyze at the building level and at the city level various aspects of urban performance. And just to uh, frame the whole uh, issue, of course, we all know we have a lot of net urban growth. A number that I use is uh, net urban growth worldwide of about 2 million new city dwellers every week for the next one and a half decades. And if all of these new city dwellers wanted to live uh, in beautiful Boston or in a city of that configuration, then that would require us to build around 400,000 buildings new every week. And if you th uh, compare that to the number of lead buildings that are certified that we have in the world, that is about 100,000. So it basically means that in a couple of days, uh, we would wipe out all the great progress that we've been made on the green building arena. So this really triggered us to say we have to develop uh, tools and metrics to not only look at individual buildings, but at whole cities. And of course, while we are often concentrating on energy, energy can't be everything, because if we look at these different modes of urban living, from informal settlements all the way to the plus energy house in Germany, if we only looked at energy, we would tell everybody in the world you have to build a plus energy home, which is, of course, uh, very unrealistic. So a couple of years ago, we uh, set out and uh, started to develop an urban modeling platform that we are calling UMI, which is available from our website. And it allows you to look at multiple levels of urban performance, so operational building energy use, embodied energy use, mobility, walkability, outdoor comfort, daylighting, and costs. We can look at a neighborhood under all of these aspects. And today, I'm going to concentrate, as I said, on operational energy and on daylight. So how do you build an urban building energy model, as we phrase it? A couple of years ago, I would have thought that's a ludicrous idea, because we pay about 15,000 for a single building to model it. So how could we do that for a whole city? So basically, the main ingredients for that is we need weather data, which is available hourly pretty much anywhere in the world where we want it. We have to work with GIS and LiDAR data sets to get the geometry of the cities right for our models. And then really uh, the most difficult part is what we call non-geometric building properties. We have to break the building stock into archetypes, and then we have to define them to a really high degree of detail, very easily. Every shower that's been taken over the year, every light bulb, every solar ray that shines on every window, we have to model all of this if we want to have a bottom-up model. So can you actually build something like this reliably? So um, a couple of years ago, we started with this type of effort in Kuwait City, where we have a large-scale project. And uh, we set out with a neighborhood of just 200 buildings. These are all single-family residential home. You see them on the left side. On the right-hand side, so you see the energy use intensity distribution measured. So this is the energy use divided by the floor area of the building. And you see a huge variety. So even though the building type is nominally the same, you see a lot of differences. So first, we try to model this neighborhood just using one building type and a city of robots. Everybody behaves the same way. And then we basically get the mean energy use right in dark gray. But in light gray, you see this white variety. We don't capture that. And then we started, OK, let's look at uh, four different building types, look at the building types by age. And that gives us some more variety. But we really only got um, satisfactory matching between the simulation and the measurements when we uh, started having uh, stochastical <coughs> occupant behavior models as well. So that uh, we tried in how far this would work if we use this model and we put it into other neighborhoods. 
This is what you see here. And what we could find is that we could still model neighborhoods even though we didn't have the energy use of them beforehand. So what this means is when we have for a whole city a couple of hundred buildings and we know their energy use, then we can model the whole building stock pretty reliably. So the next uh, test was uh, whether this method scale. So for that, we worked actually locally here with the Boston Redevelopment Authority and MIT Lincoln Lab with funding for Massachusetts Clean Energy Center on an energy model of the whole city here of Boston. And here you see a little bit of the uh, process, how this works. So we use the GIS model. Then we are using the floor print. We're building uh, the building up. We are breaking it into fl uh, individual floor areas. We have to understand where the neighboring buildings are. And then we automatically are building one energy model for every building in the city. And when you do that, then you can end up with this kind of heat maps where we can see uh, annual energy use of the whole city. And obviously, you see a lot of concentration here in the downtown area. Or we can zoom in. So here we are zooming in right on the other side of the river into Back Bay and provincial centers. We can predict energy use for every building. And then we combine that with new technologies, such if we were to use widespread deployment of photovoltaic. And then we can do this load curve analysis. So here you see the hottest day of the year. On the left-hand side, the light gray curve tells you current predicted energy use. If we introduce photovoltaic, you get this famous duck curve because the peak in the afternoon of electricity use doesn't coincide with when the PV is being generated. But then you can look at a more uh, innovative technology such as automatically controlling all the thermostats in the neighborhood, how much peak reduction that would lead to. So this is one application of a model. Another thing, this is uh, what we did in Kuwait City, where in December we presented to uh, government officials and industry representatives. We showed them that um, on the left-hand side, you see the current energy use that we could reduce overall energy use of this neighborhood by 85% with off-the-shelf technologies. So this is very useful, I think, for urban policy and goal setting, because very often cities establish goals which are aspirational, but with these type of methods, we can actually tell them if this can be realized or not. But now the next step is we're going back to Boston. How likely is this actually going to happen, right? Because um, concentrating on a neighborhood in South Boston, we looked not only at the energy use, but also at the census data. So we know on a block by block level who's actually living in this neighborhoods. We know uh, elderly couples, families, young professionals, students. There's a different demographics there. And we also know from census data how much uh, money uh, these in, uh, households have available to them. So now what we can do, we can not only on the left-hand side define how much savings with different energy efficiency packages you could introduce in a neighborhood, but also how likely that is to happen. So on the right-hand side, oh, now on the right-hand side, you see basically different scenarios. In, uh, on the far left, the blue tells you current energy use. The two green bars tell you Boston's goals for 2020 and 2080. And in between, we show you what would need to happen to get this energy use down. So in the first case, we have only uh, homeowners implementing energy efficiency measures. And then you see the top two brackets in the, of the income scale implementing. But actually, the most savings you get when you pick the oldest houses where you have a mismatch that the old houses that are not renovated also have the lowest level of income. So this really helps you if you want as a city to implement these type of goals to uh, really um, change your energy policy measures. And I'm getting the eye. I'm nearly done uh, quickly uh, uh, looking uh, beyond operation energy use. So we can also uh, predict the amount of daylight available over a whole year in a whole neighborhood. And in order to understand what this would mean for a city such as Boston, which of course has the famous old zoning laws uh, in the world, we looked at different uh, prototypes, urban prototypes, and we let them grow from stencil towers to very dense settings. And we found effectively this. So you see five different graphs here for different prototypes, how they grow. So first, I have an FAR that's pretty low, and then I make it higher and higher and higher, up into an FAR of 25. And in some cases, you get FARs that are incredibly high, and the daylighting is still good. And in some cases, you don't. So what this means is we can really create very dense cities which are still well daylit. And just to uh, convert this into value being created, for the typology A, the stencil towers, we could basically build 
a billion dollar worth of real estate in Manhattan more onto the same city block than would be allowed by current zoning conditions, but it's still good daylighting according to our analysis. So in summary, uh, we have these uh, physics-based urban level performance analysis tools now. I think uh, their time is ready to deploy them uh, with urban stakeholders for this type of um, energy and urban policy decisions. So our next step is really to educate stakeholders, practitioners, students to use these tools and have them deployed as widely as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Fascinating. <clears throat> Our next contribution comes from uh, Anita Ajundas, who's uh, CEO of Mahindra Life Space Developers Limited, uh, president of the real estate sector of the Mahindra Group. So delighted to have uh, you with us uh, and your take on some of the exciting developments that are taking uh, place related to uh, buildings and construction. Thank you, Peter. A very good morning. Uh, when Erin asked me to speak here today, I thought to myself, I know very little about bricks, even less about bits. What in heavens am I doing here? <laughs> and then Peter said, every speaker here has a proposition, a proposal. Well, Peter, I have bad news. I don't have a proposal. But what I have is a set of problems, a set of challenges in the context of the built environment in India, a country which is rapidly urbanizing. And I thought it would be interesting to share with you some of those challenges and to get your ideas around how should India be approaching its urbanization challenge. So if you look at the country today, we will be adding about 300 million Indians to our towns and cities in the next 15 years. It took us 60 years to get to 300 million in the urban context and 15 years to get to the next 3 million. That is in terms of population, and it's going to raise its own set of issues around how do we face those challenges. To me, these challenges are at three levels, the physical dimension, the social dimension, and the spatial dimension. Or in other words, the way we look at our buildings, the way we look at our communities, and the way we look at our cities. 70% of urban India is yet to be built. We have a chance to get it right first time around and not necessarily repeat some of the mistakes that many countries have done in getting heavily locked in resource-intensive, energy-intensive solutions. There is green thinking that is definitely happening in the country. A lot of players out there who are looking at how can they design better in terms of green solutions. How do we conserve water? How do we conserve energy? How do we reduce our carbon footprint? Technology definitely will play a role in enabling this. But what I wanted to speak briefly about is something that most of us tend to forget. The second largest natural resource in the world, sand. The most excavated natural resource in the world. And with huge impacts on river and coastal ecosystems across the world. Just look at concrete that we have all around us. For every metric ton of cement that we use, the six tons, the six metric tons of sand that is getting consumed. Sand that comes from riverbeds and impacts the whole ecosystem. And I think it's important, therefore, that when we look at technology and we look at green solutions, we also look at the way we can address very inherent basic problems that abound in most countries, and especially so for people like us. What we've tried doing in our business early is push value chain conversations with other stakeholders to really see how we can replace sand with more of fly ash, more of GGBs from steel slag, more of manufactured sand, so that we actually have solutions that stop using river sand. Today, at least in two of our sites, we've completely eliminated river sand. The focus, therefore, is really how can we push green thinking in our developments so that while we grow as an organization, we also grow our green footprint and drive industry advocacy. Post-living assessments that we've done of some of the buildings we've completed show a 25 to 30% reduction in water and energy consumption levels based on these principles. The second dimension that I want to really speak about was really looking at housing deficit or the social aspect of cities, which is really, when you look at urban poverty and you look at low access to affordable housing, then what we have across the world is a very large growth in slum populations, a problem that's 
not unique to India, it's common in multiple parts of the world, but something that in India we're grappling with very significantly. Private sector participation in this space has been absent. And it's been absent primarily because very few people have been able to define a business model that works, a profitable business model that will work in actually addressing affordable housing in the country. In the last two years, what we did was actually embarked on a journey in getting into this space and trying to build a profitable business model. What you see there is one of our projects in the affordable housing space, which caters to people who earn less than $1,000 monthly family income. So these are first-time homeowners, 33% of them from the informal sector, which means people who do not have bank statements, who've got access to finance, who've also got access to the home. I wouldn't say we're there fully as yet. We're still struggling with the business model. Somebody once asked me, is this CSR? CSR cannot be a sustainable business model. And so we still are struggling with how can we make it really profitable so that it actually works on a large-scale implementation level. And finally, the third layer that I wanted to speak about was the spatial dimension of cities. While we are seeing a greater amount of digitization, a larger digital world out there, but it is ironic that more and more people are actually concentrating into the mega cities. Greater numbers of people are migrating into the large cities, putting a strain on resources out there. Not very different in the Indian context, where the government is trying to push an endeavor to actually do urban renewal projects in most of our cities and get 100 smart cities up there. But India will also need multiple new cities to meet its urbanization challenges. And there what we have in terms of the efforts that we've been doing, this is a project that goes back to the 90s, in fact, is a public-private participation on creating satellite cities close to urban cores, but defining their own urban core. And what I mean by that is anchoring themselves around job creation, creating livelihood, and then driving living and life around it. Uh, this is an endeavor to actually, in a way, de-urbanize the current mega cities and create cities close to the existing cities, which have roots in the core, but are able to be self-sufficient on their own mixed-use developments. So in my view, in the Indian context, the physical, the social, and the spatial dimensions of city building are going to be exceedingly important. We just cannot wish them away. But while doing so, can we actually use what is happening out here in terms of the digital world, in terms of data, make more informed decisions, and improve the quality of urban life for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> Absolutely fascinating. Uh, and maybe the statistic of the morning that 70% of urban India is yet to be built, which kind of makes you, uh, makes you think a little bit. OK, moving on, our uh, third um, presenter uh, in this section uh, is, uh, we originally were hoping that uh, Marcio uh, uh, Lacerda, uh, who's mayor of the city of uh, Belo Horizonte in Brazil, would be with us. Uh, unfortunately, there are political commitments in Brazil that he uh, has to be uh, back to uh, uh, be involved with. Um, but I'm delighted that... Um, uh, Stefanio uh, Alexo, who's the Municipal Deputy Secre Secretariat of International Relations, uh, is with us uh, this morning and looking very much. We've talked about housing uh, or building uh, and construction and is going to offer us a take, I think, particularly about participation in that process of, uh, of uh, uh, choosing and construction. So. Um, uh, Stefanio, thank you very much for stepping into the breach. Looking forward to your presentation. So, good morning. Uh, warm regards from Mejir Lacerda. Times in Brazil are complicated, to say the least. So, um, I'm here today to, to give you a presentation on how uh, this discussion of bits and bricks actually has to be based on participation of the community, the local community, and how we are trying to do it, and all the challenges that we have been finding in Belo Horizonte. So um, the first question that I have met some people uh, here today, and uh, when I say I'm from Belo Horizonte, the first question that comes up is where is Belo Horizonte? So Belo Horizonte is a city that is located in the southeast of Brazil, but very strategic located, one hour flight from the main cities, Brasilia region, 
Rio and Sao Paulo. Um, we, are not, we do not have access to the ocean. We are a very young city. We are uh, actually created in 1887 for, to be the new capital of the state of Minas. There is a mining capital, a, a mining state, where mainly uh, the Portuguese were based when they came to Brazil to extract all, uh, well, not all, but main, main part of our gold and uh, precious stones. So, um, well, Belo Horizonte, a little bit of history. We have gained, our population has raised enormously for the past six, six decades. From the 40s, we had 2,000 inhabitants, and now we are in 2.5. So it raised enormously, as well as our metropolitan region. So, um, uh, our metropolitan region is 34 municipalities, and Belo Horizonte is the main center for all the economic activities. We are now the sixth most populous in Brazil and the third most populous metro area. Minas, uh, our state, is 20 million people, the size, territorial size of Spain. So um, a lot of challenges there. And if you don't have located Belois yet, so if I say Niemeyer, I know there are a lot of architects here. So Pampulha is the World Heritage candidate for this year. And also, um, I know there are some friends from Germany. And yes, it was in Belo Horizonte where we lost for 7-1 at Mineralm Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, regarding urban planning and thinking the city forward, uh, we had a, a radio expansion growth uh, for, our, for the past 100 years, where the city was planned to have 200,000 inhabitants, but now we have 2.5. And that, that led, uh, they took us to a whole series of urban problems. Urban problems that uh, actually are very basic ones sometimes, but at the same time, we have to tackle education and health. We have to tackle climate change and migration, for example. So how do we do it? And how do we maintain some projects at the long term? Because a mandate of four years for uh, a mayor is not long time. And all with all those changes in parties and and political views, how do we plan a city for a long term? So first of all, strategic planning, long-term strategic planning is not defined by law in Brazil, so it's political will. So we have a vision for 2030, and that vision had to be built with the society and the local community to have sustainability in the long term. So people feel that this is their project as well. And also, a, a short-term perspective for the four years has to be based in goals and results that can be measured. So we have 12 areas of results. And one strategic area for us is what we call the shared management of the city. And why is that? We think that it's very important to advance towards a participative management and prioritize investment towards the underprivileged. And for that reason, we have been built like 599 spaces between councillors, groups, forums, and uh, commissions to discuss the city. And for that reason, we have been known for the capital of public participation. So we have focused our main activities in two axes. The first one, regional participatory planning. We go into all the 40 territories that we have in the city for that reason, and we discuss with the society their priorities. And the main thing, the participatory budget, it was uh, created at the almost at the same time as Porto Alegre back at the 90s. And we have four types of participatory budgeting, a regional with each territory uh, and voting locally. We have the participatory budget that is the digi digital one. 
and we have now the child and adolescent, because the greatest challenges that we have that the participants in this process is that they are getting older and we are not able to involve the younger. So we are going into the schools and developing this will for citizenship by uh, the early ages, like 10 up to 14, 15, where the municipal uh, schools are responsible for. So we are working from uh, ground uh, with this, create, with this um, culture of participation. And um, just a quick view of the participatory digital uh, budgeting process in the, in, on the web. It's like three stages you know, information about who is a voter at the territory and uh, who is based in Belo Horizonte and information that we can uh, aggregate data. Our biggest challenge now, um, we do have a process uh, of bringing social inclusion and digital inclusion is not a 100% thing. So for the less privileged, we have to bring this option into the territory. So we have an effort of bringing those into the slums and etc. with uh, some equipment. But, um, and um, one thing that has been very effective is how we work with accountability. Accountability, uh, well, online with all the territories where you can get it and I see how much of the participatory budgeting is already finished and uncompleted in all the territories that we have interventions. Our challenges now is how we build up this platform for this new uh, master plan that has been designed and discussed with the, the municipal councillors and think how the the, uh, the society can participate, putting in and proposing new projects, and putting in and proposing and being more participative. Because the whole challenge is how the, uh, the, the part of the society that has more economic power to participate. Because normally this process is more on the territory. So how you bring everyone into this process. So this is how the challenges in Belo Horizonte are moving forward. So thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <clears throat> Very interesting. Okay, and we have a we have a bonus ball presentation for you. I think Carlo, you're going to offer us a few thoughts, probably from your uh, world, both within MIT, but in uh, your work as an architect, seeing some of the extraordinary innovation that's taking place in buildings but, and design and construction. Thank you, Peter. Um, can we have this slide? That's it. You know which one? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, um, good morning. Good morning again. Um, well, I wanted to to build to start from what we just saw about you know how do we build a lot of this urban fabric. Now, if we had asked this question, like a last century to somebody like Le Corbusier um, or some of the modernists, you know, their ideas were quite clear. It was, you know, you need to divide everything in our cities. We need to divide our cities, build our cities in a way that the place for working, the place for sleeping, the place for leisure are all separated. And then, you know, you got connections within all these different parts. But if you think about that, that's almost like an absurd city. That's a city where you duplicate a lot of the space. It's a city where, uh, you know, you need to have a place which is empty most of the time, um, and then use it just for a certain function, and then another part of the city for another function, and so on. So there's no surprise that since the 1950s and 60s in uh, all over the world, uh, Jane Jacobs in this country, but many other people, really argue for how can we make something different, something that combines different uses, a mixed-use development. But perhaps what we are seeing today is one step further. Perhaps what digital is bringing us today is another way to think about how we use space and how we can overlay different functions in the city in a new, in a new way. Something that could redefine the transition between public and private space and the very structure of, uh, of what is in our buildings. 
Now, let me try to illustrate what I mean by this uh, with, um, with one example. And the example is taken from our campus here in Boston. So you can see, I mean, Boston, as you see, it's a, it's a beautiful green city. I mean, this, uh, sorry, this picture looks a little bit like post-nuke. Um, it's a winter picture. Uh, but you see downtown Boston, you see MIT, like a little city inside the city. Uh, Harvard there, don't bother. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, um, then, you know, MIT was one of the first places to be totally covered by Wi-Fi. Uh, very, very early in the 2000s. It was Bill Mitchell, then the Dean of Architecture and Planning, who really covered the whole place with, uh, with Wi-Fi. And something interesting happened, that uh, we used to work, like you see there on the left, and, uh, and now we work in a, in a different way. A big transformation in the way people live and work. Now, this picture is a bit extreme. If you look to the left, I, uh, we looked for the most appalling computer room we could find. You know, no daylight and so on. And to the right, it's a beautiful summer day. Uh, a couple of months ago when it was freezing cold, it wasn't exactly the same. But you know, it gives you a sense of what or the transformation. So what we did, it was one of the old projects from the lab with Andres Sevsuk, who's here in the, in the audience. What we did was say, well, the, ch the internet, the, ch the net, the Wi-Fi is changing the way we live and work. So what if you could use actually the monitoring of the EIT infrastructure in order to better quantify what is going on? And so what you see here is the mapping of all the, uh, all the access points on the MIT campus, and you can use it in order to really understand how people wake up and move and, uh, and so on. Uh, for instance, if you look at like a, 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 an average day, you see it here, that's the overall activity on the MIT campus. You see uh, you know, people on Monday morning, that's Monday, getting to the campus around 9 o'clock. Uh, still working until, you know, five. a few people leaving at 5, you see, but you know, many people keep on working quite late. The same thing in the middle of the night, you see got a lot of activity uh, on the network. And the same on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Not on Friday, like all over the world, activity slips away on campus in the afternoon. And then, you know, Saturday and Sunday are almost like, you know, normal day. Uh, you see, you know, there's still a lot of activity. And also you see always this kind of little dent on Sunday night. And it's around 9 or 10 p.m. And that's when you say, well, shit, tomorrow is Monday again. And then you go back to your computer. <laughs> so anyway, you can do this for, for every room on the MIT campus. And you can do this kind of signature, occupancy signature for, for every room. Uh, and it'll be quite, quite interesting. You can cluster them. You can analyze them. And what you find is really what, a little bit of what we were saying before. That's uh, some of the results of the analysis about clustering them and doing Fourier transform to see really how different spaces work in a similar way, which is that we are overlaying all these different activities over, over space in a way we couldn't do just a few years ago. And that's because of the higher flexibility we, we have today. We're using the same thing also to, to monitor in a similar way, it's a more recent project at the Louvre Museum um, in, uh, in, uh, in Paris, where we use the same in order to really try to understand how space has been used and how it could be used better. Uh, there's some interesting research that's going on at the lab that Matthew Claudet is doing, looking at how this information can actually then impact productivity in terms of papers you write and patents and collaboration. And the exciting thing is that today we think we can start using this uh, in a way to design new cities and neighborhoods. So those are some of the projects we've been involved, we are involved at the moment, this is a new city in, uh, uh, in Mexico called Digital Creative City, where the design of these spaces try to, tries to capture some of this uh, more integrated, porous way of, uh, of living and working we see today, that's the incubator in, uh, in the city. Uh, this is a place we designed, uh, it's the largest uh, co-working space in Europe um, that uh, really tries to build into some of this, the, same, uh, the same thinking. Uh, some of the, the other ones. And the interesting thing is that when you got occupants in real time, on the one hand, you can use space in a more flexible way, but also, as we heard before from Christoph, we can also think about a building that uh, uses energy as a response to this. So it becomes a way that the building responds to you. Imagine like a bubble of heat or you know, heating, cooling, or lighting that follows you as, you as you're moving through the space. Well, that was just to share about this increased flexibility. I want to finish with one thing that was just shown last, uh, last week at Milan Design, <coughs> Design Week. And, uh, and that was, you know, when you think about this more dynamic way to live and occupy space, then how could space also itself transform? And this project was inspired by Hiroshi Ishii, who's here in the room, who did a beautiful project called Inform last year at the Media Lab. And we said, well, could we do this something like an inhabitable, almost tangible user interface where people can, can transform their space? It was done with Vitra, one of the main furniture producers in, uh, in, uh, from Switzerland main furniture producers in the world. And, uh, and here's a little video that explains the, the concept.
Right. Something here. Thanks. So, four presentations, uh, a wonderful uh, richness of perspectives. Again, I'd like, I think I'd like you to choose who you would like to draw some further comments or thoughts from. So just have another quick couple of minutes, chat with somebody, uh, then I'm going to get the panel back up here, and then coffee will, is just around the corner, I promise you. OK, once again, I'm, um, I'm happy to be very much to be driven by thoughts, questions, ideas in the room. We've got quite a richness of different uh, contributions, so happy to, for you to go down lines that you would like to go. Just put your hand up. Uh, just before I have a rush of thoughts or questions, just one, one thing that's emerged from the previous set of presentations, and this one as well, was, was just this thing around, you know, we have these technologies, we, these opportunities, this innovation, but often it's about kind of the business models that allow us to deliver stuff. And I was, I was very struck, Anita, that you, know, you were looking at the issue that there are a vast number of urban poor and there is a danger that we kind of think, oh, well, business models work for uh, you know, people on medium, high or luxury incomes and that's where the money is to be made. And there's a danger that we, that, that, that the sort of whole technology side is also kind of just working in that sphere. And I just wondered whether you wanted to comment a little bit more about the possibilities of business models that allow the finance to come in to deliver the solutions that we want in areas that are, uh, you know, really financially challenged. Do you want to offer a couple more thoughts? Well, I think the bottom of the pyramid is always seen as unsexy and unglamorous and doesn't necessarily get all the attention it should. Uh, but I guess the bottom of the pyramid is where you have massive solutions possible, the maximum amount of innovation possible in terms of being able to get financial models right. Uh, if you look at affordable housing in the Indian context, which I spoke about, and I'm sure it applies to many other parts of the world, I think the biggest challenge is in terms of A, being able to create adequate supply of houses at a certain price, and then B, giving those customers access to finance. And if these two pieces are not addressed, anything that we do in terms of cost of construction, in terms of cost of land, in terms of government policy, none of it is going to add up if you're not able to motivate enough people out there to go and create housing stock. Um, traditionally, affordable housing or council housing or whichever terminology you call it has been seen as the domain of the government, something that the government should take care of. Private sector doesn't play a role. And my point is that private sector can play a role if we innovate around uh, the way we look at cost structures, the way we look at speed of manufacturing, the way we look at customer inciting, and most important, bring in financial inclusion. Mm. And uh, our early experiments, two projects that we are running, it's not that they don't make money. Uh, do they make enough money to be a large scale economic solution? Not yet. I think there are enough people who have lots of ideas and we can really push that agenda and right. provide solutions from the private sector because then what happens is the supply issue is completely sorted out. If 10 people out there in the private sector can find an economically viable business model, you have a problem addressed uh, because there is a fundamental financial underlay sitting out there right. which justifies the business. Yeah. Do you want to add a yeah. comment on this <coughs> particular issue, Carla? Yeah, yeah um, no, I think it's a, it's a, it's a crucial issue. Uh, what I think is, is interesting is that uh, a lot of the affordability can also come by using better the things we have. And I think we heard this morning Gretchen saying, you know, when you look, for instance, at transportation, one of the things that people say is, you know, you got, a great, you got something that requires a lot of energy, a lot of money, you need to buy the car, and then use it 5% of the time. And then all of what's happening with the Zipcar and the next generation of, of sharing is that, you know, if you use that better, then it becomes more affordable for everybody. You can provide mobility in a, in a different way. And I think something similar is, uh, I believe, is starting to happen in, uh, in the built environment as well. So if you can do the idea of co-working, Exactly, is this exactly the same? And a lot of people here on the Meti, just you know, graduating, you you don't have enough money to set up an office, but you can actually use that as a co-working space. And it seems to me that the exciting thing is how we can turn that also into something that works for for housing, for a place where you live. So you say co-working or co-living. There's a few experiments going on right now, but if you do it, I think you have two advantages. The first one is that ultimately you use the square foot in a much more efficient way. So you instead of having a lot of unused time on uh, on the space you build, you can actually 
simply use it in a more efficient way. But the other thing that's more exciting is actually you created other communities. You create you know, new contacts and new connections. Uh, I, was, uh, I was talking a few days ago with Joe Gabby, one of the two co-founders of, uh, of Airbnb, you know, we're saying, well, you know, if you could do like an Airbnb block, think of it from the beginning, could this also be a way that, that brings people together to create, to make new connections, to, to interact in different ways? So these two components about, I think, in a certain sense, is both sustainability and perhaps most importantly, new sociability. Okay. Uh, Stefania, I wonder whether you want to offer a comment on, on, on this. Something that you said that it's something that happens in Brazil as well. Well, one of the well, if you look at participatory budgeting, the main uh, interventions were first infrastructure, and second uh, works on uh, slums, urbanization of slums. And when you go down to urbanization of slums, for example, some uh, some uh, housing are in risky areas, and you have to take people and build new houses uh, or, or buildings for them. But some of them, uh, it, small works can uh, can fix the problem. For, for example, the municipality can only uh, work and intervene in building new buildings and taking those people out of risk areas. And we cannot intervene in small works. So uh, business plans for small kits to uh, self interventions on those houses, for example, is something that we uh, we don't have. And that would be something intelligent to help us out. And how us municipal governments we can uh, uh, try to 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 create this uh, awareness and provoke this uh, uh, intent of uh, business that attend this demand. And another thing as well is how we um, well public private partnerships sometimes are the solution. But they're not very easy, and especially in, in a country uh, such as Brazil. So Belo Horizonte, for example, is now being the first city that it's actually, uh, apparently, it's going to work the public-private partnership for changing all the lightning at the city for, for LAD. So, uh, uh, but uh, so many tries have been done. <coughs> And uh, uh, only when we had the actual engagement for the private sector to build this model of public-private partnership that's when we actually went forward uh, w with uh, a, a, a successful model. So it has to be the will of both sides, okay. and both sides has to be engaged. Thank you. Did you want to add? Sure, very quickly. I think uh, informal settlements are, of course, a key component, and we don't want them to be part of this uh, digital revolution. But uh, informal settlements are also very active places, because if you don't have a safety net and you live there, you obviously have to every day uh, put a lot of effort into being resourceful. And uh, I'm always uh, happiest when I see how these type of technologies that we develop get actually applied there. So we have had projects in Haiti and in New Delhi, where our planning tools were applied, and it only takes one planning student from somewhere else to redesign a whole neighborhood. So I think the uh, impact level is very high. You can have at pretty low cost. So I'm pretty hopeful there. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's maybe one of the big, one of the big cha challenges for us to play with uh, uh, as innovators. I, mean, I, I was facilitating down in Cannes a MIPIM, which is a huge gathering of, of the real estate industry, and the, the theme was housing the world. And, and I was kind of thinking there's an awful lot of very interesting stuff going on, but, but it's been, been driven very much by a business model, but 80% or 70% of the population is struggling to live in cities, find respectable, affordable housing. So there's quite an interesting, just maybe a grand challenge for mm. us uh, to respond to, and maybe as a, as a set of innovators as well. It's often easy to deal with, uh, with sides that are that have more possibility of return. But that's maybe a, an interesting one to explore further further through. OK, I'll take a couple of, couple of questions, thought. One right in the centre uh, there. If you just, again, just give your name and uh, where you're from, that's always friendly. Hi, I'm Carlos Gershenson from the Sensible City Lab. Uh, I wonder whether you could comment on the relationship between housing and mobility needs, because in many cases, the affordable housing is at odds with uh, efficient mobility. So that puts a struggle on where do you put the housing and how do you build the infrastructure for mobility. OK, which will bleed us into the session uh, after lunch. Does anyone want to ob offer an observation related to that uh, connection? Well, um, 
we are trying to make an effort, but uh, well, since we have the tradition of urban planning, uh, it has been put in place for the last, let's say, 20 years in Brazil, actually. And um, so we have a difficulty, but we are trying to, to, to develop, uh, to transition to another transit-oriented development. And, uh, but that's something, for example, that we, are, we need to change legislation. So we have been for the past three years discussing with the, the, the community this new master plan, but it's now on the councillors for them to, to vote if it goes forward or not. So a lot of exercise and a lot of will from all the sectors of the city. So yes, we are trying to do, and that's the intelligent way, but sometimes it's, uh, it's not an easy answer and a not easy configuration, so. Yeah, I'd just like to add they are very critical from a point of view of total cost of ownership. Uh, the person who is looking at an affordable home also has to factor in the commute time, the cost of transportation, and therefore it's a total package. Uh, I would look at it from two perspectives. One is TOD, transit-oriented <laughs> developments, as she spoke about, and the second is de-urbanization, which is really trying to create job cores, multiple job cores in multiple locations and then settling the housing around that so that people actually have smaller commute times, smaller distances to travel, as opposed to coming into the core of the city and then going back out again. I think it's very tricky. I think uh, when it comes to sustainable living and mobility, there we have, due to these new trends, a lot of positive things to report, that people want to move back into cities and everybody wants to live walkable and so forth. But I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not as optimistic or I don't have a good solution what happens then if the affordable housing gets pushed further out of the city and then basically there are groups that are left with long commutes and it's not really clear how they're going to get into the city where the jobs still are going to be. Right? So I think that's a huge challenge. Yeah. Okay. And maybe the, the, the message from this is obviously we've divided this into four different sections for this conference, but you need, when you are innovating, changing, planning, uh, basically, you, you need to take account of a, a whole range of different uh, factors. So it's, you know, it's about the transport, it's about the energy, it's about uh, affordability, it's about the housing, it's about where people work. Um, so it's actually real planning, um, which maybe has been partly drummed out, I don't know, with the challenge of, with, the, with the public sector. I don't know. Interesting thing. There was a question just there. Hey, oh, well, well, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, no, I was, yeah, that's right, yeah, 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 but I'll come to you after. Hi, uh, this is Shobit, uh, I'm from India. Uh, I have a question that uh, we talk a lot of about uh, sustainable living and uh, other things, but we see that is not very popular at a local level. And so as a citizen or as an individual or as a part of a community, what can be done at the local level to promote awareness and what are the solutions, what we need to work with the governments, how, what we should, how we should promote these things among, the, among, among society uh, so that people, it is a popular choice uh, for the people with the available technologies. Uh, there is a lot of scope of uh, innovation uh, later on, but uh, what is there at present? How can that be made popular among, among the common right. public? I don't know whether, Stefani, you'd like to, because oh, you're very much involved in yeah. programs which are around engaging with citizens, participation. Is there something which is also a uh, awareness raising uh, element to that? Because that helps inform good choices and decisions. Yeah, that's, that's a big challenge. As I explained, for, for a city like Ballo, we have to handle uh, an agenda, the development agenda that still uh, have to face some challenges in education and health. So how you bring, for example, climate change for this discussion? And uh, first of all is to bring information. The spaces for civic participation, they're, they're open, but how do you make them more democratic? So, well, people with uh, high power, uh, 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 financial power, they usually don't participate as much as people from, uh, from uh, less uh, privileged territories, for example, in some process. So how do you bring both of them to discuss this? Uh, bringing the information is important always, 
And, but translating it is the biggest challenge. So how do I explain to someone, Miss uh, Maria in, a, a, in Seha, that is a big slum in Bello, that to tell her that if she doesn't change her old fridge, which she most times cannot because it's expensive, it's going to spend more energy and that it's, it's bad for the environment and that that can impact her life. Um, so it's a big challenge. We are trying to, to put in small words and local uh, campaigns of uh, information so to, people can say that this is a priori priority for them because otherwise it's not going to be in our priority agenda at right. the yeah, same okay. time. I but, just wanted, uh, yeah, Carlo, yeah. Okay, I say just a quick thing. I think if, um, another interesting thing is that you got, if you got more flexibility, and like it was said in the session before, you can also switch between more capex and dopex, between the capital expense and the operational one. If you think that the fridge ex example you just gave, you know, if you go and measure that, how much energy you're going to use and what is the payback time, then you can have a more sustainable way. And that one of the problems in housing today is that until today, most of the time you go, somebody building something, you're not really caring about the operational expense and somebody else coming in, and then they need to, to live with it, whatever it is, you know, maybe saving money on, on, uh, on some of the insulating material. Uh, and um, so it, that is changing as well. You see more and more systems that mix CapEx and OPEX, and I think that's going to automatically actually put incentives on, on doing this. Right. Now I'm just interested, I mean, take a, a, a you in like the uh, um, Sensible City Lab. I mean, I mean, are you spending as much, because I'm seeing lots of innovations taking place and sensors and all the rest of it. Is there a lot of work going on which is about that interface and engaging with, with people and their, where they're coming from and their interests rather than yeah. systems that kind of make things happen I think, I think that's, a good, it, that's a good question. Before we were thinking about, you know, what you, in your question was more about informal settlement and so on. But if you look at also, a, every technology will have to start somewhere and then it will trickle down. So if you look at what is happening at the other extreme and then hopefully will actually have an impact uh, everywhere. If you look at, take this building, take this room. Now, I, I, it's the first time it was just open. And in this room, probably every light, every piece of equipment in this room is actually online and you can control it. Now, the next, so this is now state of the art. Now, the next thing that, uh, that is just starting to happen, but it's going to be, have a very big impact, is that if in addition to that, you also know occupancy. I mean, I showed before using Wi-Fi, but if this becomes like it's something that you know, in, uh, you know in real time for the whole building, then uh, you can think about the, this room when uh, nobody's here, it goes on standby, pretty much like your computer. You can think about, you know, like you know, this kind of bubble of heat and lighting and, uh, and, and cooling that follows you through the building. You can think about not heating the whole space during the winter until today. Uh, we did some studies here on the MIT campus during the winter. You know, we put a lot of energy during the night on the campus in order to heat everything when, when there's nobody there. And that happens all, all over the world. So if you can actually look at occupancy, occupancy becomes an input for the building, and the building, by responding, can be much more sustainable. It's very easy, low-hanging fruit, right. how much we could save. Okay. I've got time for just one very quick one right at the back there, yes. I hope it is a quick one. It's quick. Um, to what extent will emerging technologies such as holopresence and augmented reality reduce the need for trips in the future and will it ultimately outpace a lot of our transportation infrastructure concerns and lead to new development patterns, reducing time for commute as businesses are decentralized and people don't necessarily need to move from point A to point B as much? This feels a great question for the next session on transportation. But with our panel here, who wants to... Who wants to offer that vision for the future that we'll all be sitting there waving our heads in the I air? I just wanted to ask, you know, where did you come from this morning? Uh, I'm a land use attorney at Remer and Bronson. You know, but where do you live? Massachusetts. But, but I think, you know, I think this conference shows that, uh, oh, the fact that we're here today shows that actually, uh, even if we can do a lot of things remotely, we still want to come together. There was the old, the old misunderstanding about cities in the 90s. People thought because of the internet, we don't need cities anymore. And the opposite has happened, actually. We need cities more and more just because we enjoy being each other. Now, the function might change. We might want, I mean, many things we can do on the fly, we can do, we can work from our remotely and everywhere, but actually we still want to be together. We still want to exchange ideas. I think, you know, today's, today uh, gathering is just, you know, just uh, an example right. of that. So I don't think that's going to change much. That's my opinion. I don't know what. Well, Christoph, you want to, yeah. It's one of my big p uh, pet projects, actually, that I think we should put a lot more emphasis on these technologies and make them socially acceptable. 
uh, this is part of the reason why when it comes to scope one, two, or three, most university campuses look at one and two, but nobody wants to look at the travel. Nobody really wants to collect how much we travel and reduce that because we think we have to go in the world, you're only successful if you meet. And I think that that is of course true and we want to be together. But I think we also have to start uh, finding the sweet spot when we work in projects we don't have to meet. I don't think it's worthwhile to go for a one hour flight to Kuwait every half year. I think there has to be this, uh, this um, a better understanding how often do we have to meet somebody that we know them well enough that we can reduce travel more. And I think right now technology is one thing, but just that it's accepted a little. That's not there. I always try to say when it's a thesis defense somewhere in Switzerland, oh, I don't want to come, I just want to Skype in. And then people think I, I'm weird or I don't like them or I don't think they're important <laughs> enough. Uh, but it's just really we have to reduce the travel that we're doing in the world. I think that's, I think that's key. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, time is not our friend, but I hope we've uh, offered you some further insights, thoughts, things to spark your imagination. So for now, if I could uh, thank Christoph. Uh, Stefania, Anita, and Carlo for your uh, inputs. Thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat>